number seven ministries the spirit of the lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed number seven ministries today's sermon is called did you pass your test um, in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, it says, And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him and his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Someone said, Oh, no. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Now, I believe God purposely chose the character in this parable to really make a point. You know, it could have been a, a welder. It could have been a farmer. It could have been a fisherman. It could have been all types of careers. But for whatever reason, when Jesus was making a point, he really wanted to make a home run by saying a certain priest a person with a certain position, a certain title, and a certain lifestyle that you would have certain expectations for that individual to do certain things. All right? So Jesus said there was a person that fell among things, a thieves, and they stripped him of his raiment, which means they took the clothes off from him, they wounded him, and they left him half dead. And then just by chance, the Bible said there was a certain priest or a pastor or a minister or an evangelist. He was walking by and he saw him and he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, when he was at the place and looked on him and passed by on the other side. In verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. In verse 35, and on the tomorrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host or the worker of the hotel and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that show mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. So there are three different people that had an opportunity to pass the test and only one of the three actually passed the test the two that society would expect to treat this man the best didn't they had excuses and I could uh, come up with imaginations or reasons or try to make excuses for these two uh, people of God that saw a person who was laying on the road half dead. And I could try to justify why they ignored this person half dead. They could have said, well, you know, uh, life is hard right now, and I just don't want to uh, get involved with any trouble. You know, I don't want to get involved with this. Uh, I'll just pray to God that someone else comes along and takes care of them. You know, every time we see someone on the road with a flat tire, 
and we're driving down the road, do we make excuses why not to pull over side and help them? Do we say, oh, it could be a raper, it could be a murderer, it could be someone with uh, bad intentions? You know what? At the bare minimum, we should at least pull aside when we see someone with a flat tire and ask God, God, do you want me to help this person? Because this person who broke down, it may be a test. There may be a reason why God permitted you to see this car broken down. And we sometimes just automatically put it off on someone else. Well, uh, someone else will come by and take care of them. Just like this priest and Levi did to this man that was half dead. I believe every situation that we see taking place, there's a reason why we have saw it. And we always, at the bare minimum, should pray and check in with our Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, what, do you, what will you have me to do in this situation? And I'm going to tell you, when we are s selfish, when we are always focused on ourselves, we will look for excuses why not to help other people. But when we are selfless, and we are concerned about helping other people. And when God pours out his love and we realize that we are on borrowed time every day that we wake up, we will be in touch with God's love and we will actually look for ways to help other people. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be absent-minded and go around aimlessly helping everyone unconditionally. No, God doesn't have us to be foolish. He will give us wisdom if we check in with him and ask him. But sometimes we do get selfish and we don't even want to ask God, God, do you want me to help this person? In fact, we're praying that God doesn't convict us. We're praying, God, please don't speak to me and tell me. But I'm going to tell you if we have that attitude, God, please don't tell me to help this person. You know what? We're going to spend our days miserable and unsatisfied. But if we spend our days, God, what will you have me to do? God, how can I help this person? I'm going to tell you, you will have more joy and more peace and more spiritual satisfaction than ever before. You will find yourself walking in supernatural healing. You will find yourself walking in miracles of God. But it's a mentality, a mind of Christ. And this Samaritan had that mind. Because he didn't walk by the half-dead person and say, well, you know, I just got fired and times are tough and, you know, what, what, the priest should have took care of it and the Levite should have took care of it. I'm a Samaritan. I don't even deal with these type of people. You know, who knows? He might have a gun. He, this might be a trick. He didn't do none of that. He took what he did have. He didn't make any excuses. He gave the keeper of the hotel the, 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 what it cost to take him in and instructed him to take care of him and said, I'll be back. And whatever expense he incurs, I'll come back and pay for that too. How many of us are like that in the church today? In this life, we're going to always be on two sides of the fence. We're either going to be the one who was beaten down and robbed and afflicted and God is going to use us to test other people around us. When times in our life get hard, when we're struggling, when we do lose our job, when our car breaks down, when someone robs us, when someone beats us up, when life throws us a rough hand, God is using you strategically to test all those that come in your path to see which one of them will help you. And God forbid you're actually part of a church and none of the members in the church help you at all. In fact, they purposely try to avoid you like a plague. Least you ask them for help. There are people who purposely hang around rich people so that they are never asked for help by anyone. They will purposely put themselves around well-to-do people, least a needy person asks them for help. I'm going to tell you those are some of the most miserable people you will ever find. But remember, if you are having hard times in this life, 
remember, it's just a test. And the people that are around you, your family, your friends, the church members, God's going to judge them to see if they're going to help you. Maybe you're the one that got beat up on the road. And maybe God purposely put you in that situation to use you to see how are people going to treat you. Don't worry, God has a plan. And God will always send a good Samaritan in your life. He always have a ram in the bush. It might not come when you want it, but it will come when you need it. God is not a negligent father. He will give us what we need in his time. And if it's not happened yet, just trust him. Trust him. God has never let me down. And I'm going to tell you the times where I didn't have God answer me right away, it's just a test. And now if you do see other people who are beat down and stricken, remember God's testing you. And there's going to be a blessing or a cursing upon whether you pass that test. I didn't say whether you're going to go to heaven. I didn't say whether you're going to go to hell. I didn't say that. This is not about salvation. This is about whether you're going to be blessed by the hand of God or you're going to be cursed by the hand of God on a situation by situation test. If you failed one test, be encouraged. God will give you another chance, hopefully, to pass another test. A dear friend of mine, very beautiful, uh, I believe he was a deacon or an assistant pastor, a very, very beautiful man. He was a military person, and he served very close to a pastor at a church out in Oberlin, Oberlin, Ohio. And this man is a young guy. I'm going to say he's about 30, no, 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 excuse me. He's about 40 years old. And about 10 years ago, his most beautiful wife, very, very beautiful wife, very beautiful wife. She was beautiful. And she was about 35 years old. She died unexpectedly for some unknown brain aneurysm that came out of nowhere. And they had three kids together, very beautiful, good-looking, handsome kids. And so this man is a widow now, so a faithful man of God. He's one of the picture-perfect Christians, and I'm not saying that uh, facetiously, really genuinely good Christian. And... In his church, there was about 50 people that went to the church. And at the funeral, everyone, if you need anything, you call me and you let me know. If you need anything, you call me and let me know. I understand that's a common cliche saying. I'm going to tell you, just being, just telling it as it is, that's one of the stupidest things you could ever tell anyone ever in your life. I don't want to sugarcoat this. That is a dumb thing to say if you need anything. How about this? We put ourselves in that man's shoes, and how would you feel if your wife, who was beautiful, died and left you as a widow with two kids? What do you mean if you need it? babysit for him. Don't even ask, sir, uh, you work Monday through Friday, I'm coming over to babysit. I'll pay for the babysitter. Your wife who was cooking you three meals a day, I'm going to start sending you, uh, I'm going to cook meals for you. Don't ask if you need anything. If you were in his shoes, what would you want other people to do to you? Do you know everyone from that church? And notice I did not say the name of the church. I just said it was in Oberlin. All 50 of the people, including the pastor, nobody did nothing to help that man other than empty void words. If you need something, I'll help you. Let me know. What do you want the poor man to do? Beg you for help? Come on. I didn't even go to that church. I just knew him. I didn't even go to the church. I visited it, and I knew him to be a good-hearted person, and his wife was a beautiful person too. And God told me, I don't know what God told anyone else, God told me to 
go to the dollar store, pay a dollar for a card, and encourage them in the card. And go to Subway and spend $20 and put a Subway gift card in there and send it to them. Not that deep. I was only making $800 a month. And God told me to do that. And this man sent me back an email. And he said, you know, after six months of my wife dying, you're the only person who did anything for me? That's an abomination and a judgment against the people of God. And, and the reason why I share that, not to make myself to be some great person, it's just the simple stuff that we all can do. Don't have the audacity to ask someone. You know someone's sick? Do something for them. Don't ask... If you need anything, help me. You know, it's like the Good Samaritan. What if the Good Samaritan would have walked by after a priest and a Levite walked by and the Good Samaritan would have saw him half dead? Well, sir, I can see the tooth hanging out of your mouth and looks like you're about to bleed to death. Well, if you need anything, just call me. You know, I know we don't have cell phones in this day and age, but send me pigeon mail. If you need something, send me a pigeon mail. Come on. This good Samaritan took it upon himself. There's some things we shouldn't even need to pray about. God tells us to help people in need. Because God, who is sovereign, strategically placed Esther in a position to help God's people. And in order for Esther to help God's people, she was going to have to risk her life. She was going to have to give up everything to help God's people. And God, you know, God has a way of dealing with us. I don't know whether God actually gave her a choice or not. Look at the way God talked to her. And sometimes we make God to be something he's really not. Sometimes we make him to be this soft, pansy, weak, happy-go-lucky I don't even know what we try to make them in our mind. But look at what God said. God said, Esther, I have put you in this place for a reason and for a time such as this. Now, either you go and talk to this king and help my people, or I will destroy you and your household, and I will replace you and raise up someone else to do what I told you to do. Doesn't that sound like a loving God to you? It is a loving God, but what is love? God is love, and God operates the way he chooses to operate, not according to our imagination of how we think he should operate. God, his wisdom is superior to ours. So we just need to humble him, agree with him, obey him, and trust him that he knows what he's doing. But when God puts us in a particular situation, realize he's testing us, and if we fail the test, we will be cursed, and when we get cursed, God will use someone else and raise them up and give them the same test that we failed and bless them when they obey God. And God will come to us throughout our walk, our Christian walk. God will come to us. And sometimes it's a small thing. You know, I'll give you an example when I say sometimes it's a small thing. Sometimes it's not always risking your life and throwing yourself down before the king. And sometimes we're not in that particular situation. But sometimes... God will speak to us in a still, small voice. There was a time uh, before I had a license in a car, and I was a deacon at a particular church, and I was waiting for the bus to pick me up so I could go to church. And I lived about three miles from the church, and I was standing in front of the RTA bus stop, and God said, I want you to go to the next RTA bus stop, maybe a two-minute walk. So, so I wrestled with it. I always wrestle against God. I don't just graciously say, yes, Lord, and throw myself. No, I wrestle. I, I use logic. I, I listen to the devil a little bit, and I listen to how my emotions, my pride, how I feel. And then sometimes I listen, and sometimes I don't listen. Sometimes I disobey God, and there's consequences for it, and some of them are painful financially, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So God says, go down to the next bus stop, and I go down to the next bus stop. Walk about two minutes, and then after I sit there for a few seconds, God said, now I want you to go down to the next bus stop. And I said, God, if I keep doing this, I don't need to take the bus anymore. So I go down to the next bus stop, and God says, that's nice. Now go down to the next bus stop. And so I go down to the next bus stop. 
And then God said, now go down to the next bus stop. And I'm going to tell you, at this point in time, I'm halfway there. And God said, go down to the next bus stop. And I notice how God, when he asks us to do something, he doesn't put more on us than we're able to bear. Because I honestly believe, had God told me to walk halfway there at the first time, I would have said, God, are you sure this is you? <laughs> You're not making any sense. And I probably would have disobeyed him. But God just told me to do inch by inch. A lot of times he just graciously deals with us. Not all the time. A lot of times. And so I go down. I'm over halfway there now. And I'm past halfway there. And then finally I see a girl at the next bus stop. And God said, I want you to go over there and talk to her. Thinking she looks like an unsavory character. She was a prostitute. And I walked over to her and I talked to her. And no matter how hard I try to suppress Jesus inside of my heart, in fact, the more I try not to talk about him, the more he explodes and comes out. And I start preaching or witnessing or something. The more I try to resist him, the more I try not to talk about him, the more he comes out. So I witness to this lady, and after everything's said and done, she's crying, and I invite her to church with me. She comes to church with me on the bus and I believe she said it was her first time in church after like 15 years she said she was a prostitute she's on drugs and she came to church with me and I believe everything that we do in this life is a test are we going to obey him and sometimes the test doesn't always appear obvious at first it doesn't always seem logical and we don't always know and God's not obligated to explain everything to us he wants to test us to see are we going to obey him because God could have made that woman just appear in the church without me but he wants to use us. He wants to test us because he's God. He does the way he wants to do. And if we fail the test, God can and will destroy us and raise someone else to do the same test that he asked us to do. So we never, we should always be humble with that in mind. We should never feel like, oh, if, if, if we didn't show up today, the church would be destroyed. I don't care if you fly around in jets and fly across the world and preach to millions. God will use anyone. A donkey. He'll use whoever he chooses. So don't, we should never, never be prideful. Matthew chapter 5 verse 40. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who we serve. He said, if you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. God is purposely going to put people in our lives who society would consider an outcast, a reject, worthless, no value, dangerous, crazy, weird, smelly, stinky, poor, broke, greedy, irritable, on drugs, homeless, whatever. God will put the least of the world in front of us and God will test us to see how we've treated that person. And Jesus Christ himself, he said this. He said, when you've done it unto him, you've done it unto me. So indirectly, that person represents Jesus to us. And if we say we love Jesus, then we will pass the test on how we treat who the world rejects. I'm going to tell you, by God's grace, he's given me a wisdom to purposely, right from the get-go, to reach after the people that the world would reject. I purposely want to go to the hospitals and see the people that are dying. I purposely want to go to the jails and look at and, and, and work with the murderers, the rapers, the child molesters, the drug dealers, the robbers, the people who a lot of the world would consider to be a waste of time. That's the people that I'm purposely looking for, but not restricted to them, whoever God puts. Because my test might be how I treat a rich person that comes in my past uh, with gator boots and a Cadillac living in a mansion with millions of dollars. Will I still show that person the love? that I would a homeless person. God knows how to test us. What may be a test for one might not be a test for another. But God knows how to hit us where we're going to be tested, challenged. The teachers know the students and their 
ability and the level to be able to test them. And God knows us too and how to test us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Uh, it speaks for itself. God can use angels that we don't recognize they're angels. They might not have wings and halos, just ordinary people. God can send angels in our life to test it, to see how we're going to treat them. See if we're going to give them love. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 4. You know, it's one thing if we don't want to obey God and help people. And it's another if we're persecuting the people that God is sending to help people. I can't think of a greater, a greater um, abomination in God's eyes. God, to this day, he uses men and women of all ages, all races, all throughout the world, and he sends them on assignments. He sends us on assignments. And there are demon-possessed people who will abuse, persecute, mistreat the people that God is sending on an assignment. And I'm going to tell you, this is why there is a hell. God has a place reserved for those who reject him. And I don't believe it's ever a single rejection. I believe it's a continual rejection. A continual over and over and over rebelliousness of disobeying God, rejecting the people that he sends before us. And we have to remember the people that come before us who are inviting us to church, the people who are coming before us who are trying to share the love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are people that is, are being led by the Spirit of God. And the way that we treat them, God will hold us accountable for them. My wife is my best friend. I think more important than anything else, you have to uh, be a friend. You have to, your wife should be, or your husband should really be your best friend. If you can't build that friendship, the romance aspect will fade. Uh, right now we have a, a driven world where we're trying to move ahead and, and be our own person and we're not willing to sacrifice to the marriage. And the marriage has to come first. Um, of course, Christ has to be in it. As he sacrificed for his church, we need to be sacrificial in our marriages. Very simple. The other problem is communication. We're busy communicating with everybody else except our spouses. And uh, it's a problem today. Uh, we're on email, we're on Facebook, we're on this, we're on that, and we're communicating with everyone else but the person that's in the house with you. We've been married uh, uh, December the 20th of this year, will be 32 years. People don't stick to commitments. Um, when you take your wedding vows, I mean, you commit to uh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and you actually make a covenant, and I think that most people don't understand what a covenant relationship is. That means that two parties agree, they come together, and they commit to making things work. First of all, we need to make sure that it's God's will, and that we are engaging in godliness. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And I believe that one of the reasons why that marriage is like it is, is because it's too easy, first of all, to get out. We've been married six years, dating me. So a lot of people in the church are currently in blended families right now. I think we've removed God out of a lot of the systems, our, our school systems, our court systems, and even from the family standpoint, a lot of families are, it's a fast paced moving world now. They don't sit down to eat anymore. They don't pray before meals. Um, rarely do you see the whole family at the church in one body. They're either off in separate parts of the church even. The foundation of marriage is based on a three-court strand and a lot of families are living a one or two-court strand. 
Um, you know, with a three-chord strand, it's you, your wife, and God. As it makes up the strand, it's not easily broken.